There are not enough people. I can't emphasize this enough. There are not enough people. If people don't have more children, civilization is going to crumble. Mark my words. Hey, what's up, guys? So I've gotten a handful of questions and requests to do a video on fertility over the past few months. And so um, I know a lot of you guys might be tempted to click off of this video because you guys are like, hey, Zach, I don't want no babies right now. I'm going to come at you like a spider. But um, this is not just a video about fertility. In many ways, fertility can kind of be looked at as an overall indicator of testicular health. And when fertility goes down, it's usually indicative that uh, overall testicular function is being reduced. And so essentially what I wanted to do um, is do a video on just overall testicular health and how to improve testicular health as well as fertility. Now, as I was doing research for this video over the past couple of weeks, um, I found a lot of different super interesting things. And one of the more interesting things that I found out was that uh, fertility rates have plummeted, literally plummeted, um, by over one half over the past 50 to 60 years. But what's even more interesting is that there's actually an ideological faction that's out there that's actually advocating for lower fertility rates. And so what I want to do in this video is not just look at the biological traits and the phenomenon of lowered fertility and how to reverse it and how to improve testicular health, but I also want to look at some of the weird ideologies that are actually advocating for uh, lowered fertility rates and kind of discuss why uh, this is such a big issue. Now, if we zoom out a little bit and look at the global population as a whole, we will notice that we are just under a um, billion people on the earth today. But if you look at the population growth over time, um, especially over the past few centuries or so, you'll notice that from around 1800 to about 1960, that the earth's population has roughly tripled from about 1 billion to 3 billion people. Now, this led a lot of the intellectuals in the 1960s to be concerned with the risk of global overpopulation. And in 1968, a Stanford bio biologist named Dr. Paul Ehrlich published his best-selling book, The Population Bomb, where he made a case for imminent global overpopulation. Now, in this book, he made the infamous claim that hundreds of millions of people would starve to death in the 1960s because of overpopulation. But guess what? This didn't happen. <laughs> but even though this prediction never came about, it hasn't stopped um, this kind of overpopulation ideology from gaining a ton of momentum throughout the rest of the century. And even to this day, we have guys like David Attenborough um, making claims like this. I have no doubt that the fundamental source of all our problems, particularly our environmental problems, is population growth. Uh, I can't think of a single problem that wouldn't be easier to solve if there were less people. I suppose the biggest apt, uh, impact on human health I've seen is slums. Uh, slums in South America, slums in India, slums in uh, Africa. Um, huge areas occupied by people living whole families in tiny little apartments uh, with no sanitation um, and uh, no future. Now, their primary line of reasoning here seems to be that as the population explosively grows, that um, resources don't, and as the population grows, there's going to be increasing conflict and poverty because of the um, constraint on the availability of resources. And you see this line of reasoning show up in David Attenborough's comments in this video um, when he's talking about the slums and poverty and starvation that's happening globally because of overpopulation. And not only do you you see it in his comments, but you also see it uh, show up in a lot of the research papers that have been published over the last several years on this topic as well. However, there's one major problem with this line of reasoning. It's not true. I worked on a UN committee, oh, it's got to be 10 years ago now, um, to help draft the UN Secretary General's report on sustainable economic development. And so I looked at all sorts of things like that. I was very curious, for example, about, because people have been beating the overpopulation drum since, well, it really kicked in in the 1960s, you know, because there were dire predictions by the year 2000, the Club of Rome came out and said, well, there'll be riots and mass starvation and mass movement of, of migrants and all the things you hear about climate change. 
because there's too many people on the planet. And that just didn't happen at all. That was just that it wasn't just wrong. It was anti-true. It was absolutely wrong. What happened instead was that everyone got way richer and the, the bottom section of the population in terms of economic distribution got lifted out of poverty. Inequality still exists, but that's that power law phenomenon we already talked about. Not that that's trivial, it's just unbelievably difficult to determine what to do with. Even though the global population has more than doubled since in the 1960s, the global poverty rate has actually plummeted over that same course of time. It does not appear at all that resources are actually running out. And on the contrary, it actually looks like humans are actually somehow figuring out a way to innovate in such a way as to reduce absolute and total poverty levels uh, globally as the population is also exploding. Loading. Now, with all of that being said, I do think it is important to point out here that even though the global population has been exploding over the past couple of centuries, the global fertility rate has actually been plummeting. In the same amount of time that the global population has doubled, the global fertility rate has actually been cut in half, and uh, the fertility rate has actually plummeted so quickly uh, that a lot of experts actually predict and expect the global population to peak in about 20 years. Now, because of this, some experts expect uh, to see within the next 20 to 50 years what's known as a population collapse, as opposed to population explosion and overpopulation, which is the exact opposite of what some of these alarmists have been kind of ringing the bell about over the past 50 to 60 years. You're more worried about underpopulation. Oh, yeah, yeah. Earth, um, Earth is going to face a massive population collapse. Uh, in, in, in over the next 20, 20 30 years, massive, um, and it's this. This is definitely you know, will civilization, you know, the question of like is civilization gonna die with a bang or a whimper? This would definitely be dying with a whimper. Yeah, we, um, we need. We need the birth rate is very low. Yeah, it's it's been dropping. Right, it used to be five yeah. six children per family globally. It's like two point four. Below in the U.S., it's below below replacement levels. Uh, I mean, in, in in most of Europe, Russia, Japan, Korea, Singapore. Um, you know, uh, it's, uh, it, it's it's well below replacement, and and you know, this the the social networks and everything. We're not, I mean, the, the social support networks were not really set up for a, a high ratio of retirees to workers. Somebody, so so then. Well, we, thank I mean, God we, we got robots we, we, coming in. Yeah, the robots exactly. We need those. We need those robots, but you, you don't want to have the the youth effectively enslaved to take care of the elderly. You know, which is what would kind of happen if if you have an upside down. Uh, demographic pyramid. Now, there are several proposed reasons as to why this is actually happening. However, one of the most overlooked reasons is because of the actual reduced uh, reproductive capacity of men. In the same time span that uh, birth rates have fallen by about 50%, um, the sperm count and sperm quality of men has also dropped by about 50%. And as this article points out, sperm counts among men have more than halved in the last 40 years research suggests, although the drivers behind the decline remain unclear. The latest findings reveal that between 1973 and 2011, the concentration of sperm in the ejaculate of men in Western countries has fallen by an average of 1.4% per year, leading to an overall drop of just over 52%. The results are quite shocking, said Haggai Levine, an epidemiologist and lead author of the study from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. While infertility treatments such as IVF can offer solutions to potential ramifications of the decline on one level. Little has been done to address the root of the issue, said Levine, pointing out low sperm counts might also be an indicator of poor health among men more generally. This is a classic under-the-radar huge public health problem that is really neglected, he said. And so not only does it appear as though the birth rates and um, fertility rates are declining dramatically globally and specifically within Western nations, it also appears as though the um, one of the leading causes of this is actually the drop in the reproductive capacity of men. Now, the biggest question at this point would obviously be why, and so for the rest of this video, what I want to do is talk about some of the leading causes that could be potentially um, leading to lower fertility rates in men specifically, as well as um, some practical steps that we can take in order to kind of reverse this. Now, from what I can tell, there are essentially four primary leading causes.
differences uh, when it comes to these drops in male fertility rates. Now, the first one I think is the most obvious, and that is a massive increase in obesity levels. Uh, the second is a lack of micronutrient intake. The third is the presence of endocrine disrupting chemicals in our house's food and water supply. And the fourth that we're going to talk about today is a lack of sunlight. Now, the first one that we're going to talk about today is again, the most obvious one, which is the massive explosion in the rates of obesity over the last uh, several decades. And what's most alarming is that obesity rates have actually quadrupled in the last 60 years. Now, the reason that obesity is so destructive to overall testicular health and testosterone levels as well as fertility is that adipose tissue actually um, exerts a high proportion of the enzyme aromatase. Now, aromatase is the enzyme that actually converts testosterone into estrogen. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing in individuals that are metabolically healthy. However, when you have a large amount of this enzyme in your body, it will convert a lot of your testosterone into estrogen, which is obviously going to lower testosterone levels. But the bigger issue when it comes to testicular health is that when you have a lot of estrogen in your body, it actually signals to your brain and it signals to your hypothalamus to actually shut down the production of gonadotropic hormones, which actually will cause a drop one in testosterone, but also in fertility rates. And so for most men that are carrying a little bit of extra body fat around their bellies, one of the best things that you can do for just overall testosterone levels, testicular health and fertility is to simply lose some body fat. This is going to help reduce the amount of the aromatase enzyme that's present in your body and will actually help to signify to your brain that it needs to produce more testosterone. Now, again, the second most likely reason that fertility rates have been plummeting over the past 60 years is because of simply a lack of micronutrient intake. And these would be things like vitamins and minerals. Now, it's going to be a little bit out of the scope of this video to talk about all of the micronutrients that are needed in order for proper testicular function. Now, maybe I can do a video on that in the future. However, to kind of hit some of the high notes here, some of the more important micronutrients that are needed for proper testicular function would be things like zinc and vitamin D, as well as magnesium and vitamin A and boron. And when you are deficient in these micronutrients, you just are going to have hindered uh, testicular function. Now, one of the more practical ways that you can prioritize micronutrient intake is obviously to just prioritize foods that are high in micronutrients. So these would be things like red meat and eggs and fish and dairy. And contrary to popular belief, these are actually some of the more micronutrient dense foods on the entire planet. And because they come from um, animal sources, they are extremely bioavailable. Now, if you are somebody who has not prioritized their diet in a long time, um, adding a um, multivitamin, a high quality multivitamin into your diet um, can help to somewhat reverse some of these um, micronutrient deficiencies, but long term, your best bet is to simply just increase uh, the value of your food intake. Now, this third reason is somewhat more controversial than the first two, and that is because of the presence of um, endocrine disrupting chemicals in our food, water, and homes. Now, there are literally too many of these chemicals to mention in this video. However, I will link a article down below where you guys can kind of check out some of the more popular and kind of most used endocrine disruptors so that you can avoid these. But with that being said, I will say that one of the most practical ways that you can avoid endocrine disrupting chemicals is to simply get a reverse osmosis system for your home or just to simply switch over to exclusively consuming and drinking reverse osmosis water. A lot of these endocrine disrupting chemicals end up concentrating in the water supply. And so again, one of the more practical ways that you can avoid these chemicals is just to simply switch to reverse osmosis water. Now, the fourth reason this is likely happening is because of a lack of sunlight. Now, I just got done finishing and publishing a video on the effects of light therapy on testicular health. And so if you guys haven't checked that video out yet, I would highly recommend it. There is an extremely strong correlation and connection between uh, sunlight exposure and testicular health. And so um, our ancestors got way more sunlight than us. But because the typical man 
man spends so much time indoors nowadays, I do think it is highly important that we prioritize sunlight exposure. And um, a lot of experts recommend to get roughly 15 to 45 minutes of um, sunlight exposure per day in order to optimize uh, just overall health. And personally, this has been one of the bigger um, changes that I've made to my personal health regimen over the past several months. And I've noticed a huge difference in just overall mood and well-being. And so I can personally attest to this one. And so if you aren't getting enough sun, just get more sun. You'll thank me later, I promise. Now, the last thing I want to talk about before we close out this video is some supplements that you can take. You guys know I'm a huge fan of supplementation, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this specifically. However, I did want to list some of the more proven uh, supplements to improve fertility and just overall testicular health. And uh, number one would be things like L-carnitine, um, taking one to two grams per day. And then after that, things like um, deaspartic acid, which have been shown to improve testicular function, fertility, and testosterone production in men that are um, infertile. And so taking two to three grams of that per day would also be a good option. And then beyond that, I would also look into things like mucunipurians and Tonkat Ali and ashwagandha and ginger. Now, these are all supplements that I have done in-depth videos on in the past. And so if you're interested in checking some of these supplements out, I would highly recommend just looking through my channel and watching some of the videos on those. Um, in general, all of these supplements appear to have um, some potent effects on testicular health and testosterone levels as well as fertility. And so especially if you are experiencing infertility and you're trying to get pregnant, adding some of these supplements into your uh, daily regimen can provide a huge difference. Now, if you guys are interested in testing your actual um, testicular health, one of the most practical ways that you can do that is to simply get a blood test done to test your testosterone levels and your estrogen levels. And so if you guys are interested in that, one of the most practical, simplest, and easiest ways to do this is through getting a home test done. And so if you guys are interested in getting an at-home hormone panel done, I would highly recommend checking my friends out at Let's Get Checked. If you guys are interested in that, there's going to be a link in the description where you can um, purchase one of those tests. But other than that, guys, if you're interested in any other supplements that can be used to improve overall health in men, um, please check out the complete guide to supplementation that's also linked down below. But other than that, I think I'll see you guys next time.